Uh, this is Yu Meng Li. She's a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, which is, of course, part of the, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, P20 Center. So go ahead, Yu Meng. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to join this uh, meeting, and I'm very honored to deliver my talk here. Um, I will present our ongoing work. Uh, the project name is Segmentation and Registration of Kidney Stones on CT Imaging. So our team goal is to create an automatic tool to accurately identify and measure the kidney stones on CT scans. By achieving this goal, we have two subtasks. The first task is for image segmentation. We want to utilize a deep learning and transformer models to automatically segment urinary tracts, including the kidneys, bladders, and ureters on CT urograms. Then after we obtain the kidney segmentations, we want to apply an image registration technique. The goal of, of the image registration technique is to study the statistical dis uh, spatial mapping of the kidney stones based on the kidney atlas derived from CT scans. Um, so for image segmentation, we, um, the machine learning experts and urologists are taking this approach differently. So for, in order to generate the uh, segmentation labels for urinary tracts, the urologist usually will manually review the uh, scans and they will manually label the uh, organ of interest in that scans to generate the annotated data set. However, for machine learning expert, we aim to design a deep learning model to, uh, based on the annotated data set to predict the urine, uh, urinary tracts based on the annotation data set. This deep learning model will be applied to any unseen data set for urinary tract segmentation predictions. So um, here comes to our study design. Um, we designed an image segmentation deep learning model, and we utilized the 122 CT urograms uh, collected from the CT sc scanner at National Hospital. And for each CT urogram scan, we have the certified radi uh, urologist to lab uh, manual label the kidneys, ureters, and bladders. And those manual segmentations are used as ground truths to train the deep learning model. We therefore proposed the deep learning model for urinary tract segmentations. As shown in the image below, the uh, deep learning model will take the input of the CT scan and it will um, output the urinary tract segmentations. We have the kidney labeled in red, uh, ureter labeled in green, and the blood labeled in blue. In our model, we randomly choose 98 uh, scans for training and 24 scans for testing. Here are some demonstrations of the representative cases um, generated from our model. So the image on the left, we first have the, the first column is original image slice, and the second column is the annotations, and the third column is our model predictions. The annotations are generated from the uh, manually segmented from the uh, radio uh, urologist. And our model is uh, trained based on those generated annotations. So from the image, you can see that our model prediction is very close to the annotations, and it correctly labeled the kidneys and ureters and bladders. Also, well, um, it's very um, common that for uh, CT urograms, the bladders, the intensity distribution of the bladders are different. As shown sure in the image, on the uh, upper, uh, the top part of the bladder, you can see there is a less intensity, but on the bottom part of the bladder, you can see more intensity. Um, our deep learning model will able to identify both uh, diff uh, the bladder based on the different intensities and the correctly segment the bladders. On the image, uh, for the image on the right, uh, we displayed our, uh, the 3D view of our annotated labels and our predictions. From the image, you can see our predictions um, is uh, generally very close to the annotations and correctly labeled the kidneys, ureters, and bladders. So um, in order to uh, evaluate our model performance, we use the mean dice score. So the mean dice score um, shows the, cor the correlation between our predicted labels, uh, the overlapping between our predicted labels and the ground truth labels. So the higher the mean dice score, the better the model is. And the best mean dice score for the model is close to 1.0. So based on our model performance, we can see that for both kidneys and bladders, our model could achieve the mean dice score above 90%. 
Um, and in our later work, we have uh, we have also improved our model uh, for Im of just for kidney segmentations with the expanded data set. And our current model achieved the DICE score per kidney um, to 96%. So from these results, we can see that our proposed deep learning model can effectively label the kidneys, ureters, and bladders on the CT urograms in an automatic manner. Then after we obtain the kidney segmentations um, from the deep learning model, we want to study and understand the, how kidney stones uh, statistically distribute across subjects within the kidney. As shown on the image in the um, bottom left, uh, right, you can see uh, this is the uh, segmentation, uh, kidney segmentation of uh, different patients, and the, the kidney stone is distributed uh, across different locations. So we want to study how those kidney stones are statistically distributed across different patients. So by doing so, um, we spatially transformed the kidney stone image of each, ki uh, each kidney corresponding left or right kidney atlas with the same image deformation obtained for creating the atlas. Um, here is uh, one of the uh, representative slides of our study. So the slides on the, uh, the image on the left show the statistical uh, spatial mapping of the kidney stones derived from the non-contrast CT scans uh, with, uh, of uh, 112 patients with the kidney stones. The color bar indicates the frequency of the kidney. Um, the image on the right showed the kidney atlas uh, visualized with the 3D surfing rendering. From this image, we can see the, uh, actual, the actual distribution of the kidney stones um, by, um, by, my, by using uh, image registration technique um, to help us understand how the, how the kidney stones are statistically distributed across the, the patients. Um, so based on our registration results, we can um, conclude that the, automat um, the automatic stone identification algorithm detect the individual kidney stones with 100% sensitivity. And the statistical spatial mapping of the kidney stones quant um, quantifies spatial frequency of the kidney stone across subjects with the highest frequency up to 35%. So in summary, um, we developed an autom automatic tool to accurately identify the organs in the urinary tracts, including kidneys, ureters, and bladders. The statistical uh, spatial mapping of the kidney stones provide a, a quantitative means to characterize frequency of the stone within the kidneys. Lastly, I, will, uh, I would like to thank for all uh, our team's effort to help us um, generate the manual labels and to guide me uh, through this research. And I would like to thank for P20 grants to support us continue uh, working on this project. And thank you so much for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. We will have time for questions and answers and comments at the end of the session. So if you Ming will uh, stay with us, there yes. might be some comments for you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Abe Singh, a medical student. Uh, hey, I'm here to talk about uh, machine learning to predict urethral stone passage. Um, kind of our rationale and aim for this study, um, predicting spontaneous passage of urethral stones is difficult. Um, successful prediction can mitigate the risks of unnecessary surgery or prolonged and painful unsuccessful trials of passage. So for example, a patient might come in and decide to operate on them when they could have had, when the stone could have been passed spontaneously. So this patient's kind of unnecessarily being exposed to the risks of surgery and anesthesia. On the other hand, a patient um, who ultimately will need surgery, you could attempt a trial of passage with them. In this case, this patient's kind of uh, in pain for a few days or maybe even longer and could be missing out on school or work, which could be avoided by uh, like an early prediction. So our goal is to use, a mach use machine learning to create a model that uses patient clinical and imaging uh, data to predict spontaneous reroll stone passage. 
We hope that this will provide uh, better individualized care through early identification of patients who have a successful trial of passage versus those that will require surgery. So um, our methods, so this is a retrospective cohort study. I think our data is from about 2004 to 2020. Um, we have children and adults who presented to CHOP and PEN with renal stones and had a CT scan. There's a CT scan with a renal stone for the experienced clinicians in the room. I'm sure you look at it and are like, that's a renal stone. For a second year medical student like myself, that arrow is very useful. <laughs> um, the outcome is the spontaneous stone passage and our exposure is axial, vertical and horizontal stone length, which we kind of combine into our orthogonal measurement product, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So our data, so we created two separate models for the pediatric and adult population because we found that different uh, features were important for each for those separate groups. We had a total of about 256 patients out of which 153 were adults and 103 were uh, PD, uh, children. Uh, the age for the adults was 57, 14 for the kids. 36% um, of the adults were female, 51 for the kids. And 44% of the adults passed their stone, stone spontaneously and 54% for the pediatric population. Um, and then I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about our modeling approach. So we went with a random forest model um, it's a type of machine learning model that's especially good at making binary predictions when you have a lot of features to select from. Um, what it basically does is it creates uh, many uncorrelated models and tallies each of their predictions to predict an outcome. Now that kind of sounds confusing, but I think with the image, we can help kind of uh, break that down a little bit. So it's gonna create a lot of models. In this case, we have nine and each of them is gonna make a separate prediction. And what our overall prediction is gonna be, is gonna see what the majority predicted and go with that uh, prediction for our, like our, the overall result. And how it creates these models is that it'll select individual, it'll select a randomized subset of your features and a randomized sample of data for model training. So what this means is for example, say we have five features we wanna to use to predict a spontaneous stone passage. A red model over there might randomly select three of them. Our blue model might randomly select a different three. Our green model might select four. So this way we create a lot of different models. And like there's, the goal is to create a lot of them that hopefully we reduce bias. They also randomly select um, data, our sample of your data. So for example, for our pediatric population, we had 103 patients. So our red model might select 60 of them. Our blue model might select a different 40. And the sampling is also done with replacement. So this means there's a large variety of, uh, there's a large like random sample you could pick from, for even, from even just a population of 103 uh, patients. And then each feature is considered dependent on each other. This is kind of just the nature of random forest models because they go by decision trees. So if you go down a decision tree, your further uh, down features are kind of dependent on the ones that occurred earlier. So our model creation, this is kind of how we went about the process of making this. So our initial step was to just assess correlation of a lot of features like BMI, hematuria, nausea, fever, flank pain, and a bunch of others and see how well they correlated with our um, outcome, which is spontaneous stone passage. So here I just have an example of hematuria, which we actually didn't end up using, but I just wanted to explore um, how, we, how we went through this process. You can see on the left, um, patients that didn't have hematuria were 50-50 uh, likely to have surgery or not have surgery. And patients who did have hematuria were actually less likely to require surgery, which kind of suggests that hematuria is not really well correlated with our outcomes. So that's kind of one of the reasons we ended up not using it in our model. We also tried creating some new variables like symptoms, which just looked at if the patient had any symptoms and try to see if that was predictive as well. And then, like I mentioned earlier, um, we knew that stone size would be a big predictor because um, obviously that's heavily correlated with um, spontaneous stone passage. So we created this uh, new variable called orthogonal measurement project product, which multiplied the stone axial, horizontal, and vertical length. Um, we found that this variable was worked better in our models than either axial, horizontal, or vertical distance did individually. It was a better predictor than each of them individually or both of them together in our model. So that was great. That was a good finding. Um, and then this graph really over here kind of convinced us to also include age in our models. So this is kind of a lot going on over there, but um, we're looking at OMP on the y-axis, which is our proxy kind of for stone size. And we're looking at age on the x-axis and each graph that's next to each other shows on the left is uh, patients that pass their stone and on the right is patients required surgery. So you can kind of see that all the fail patients, the stone size is a little bit larger. 
And you can also see the trend that as patients are getting older, their stone size is increasing. So this kind of showed us that maybe age has an interesting a role to play here, both with stone size and with um, the prediction of whether they're going to pass or not. So we definitely wanted to include that in our model as well. Um, here are actual models. So this is our adult model. Our model accuracy was 63%. And then our ROC curve, which is kind of a measure of sensitivity and specificity. Um, and our area under the curve, it kind of shows an area of the curve, an ideal area under the curve would be one, which would mean that you're making perfect predictions. An area under the curve of 0.5 would mean that your, your model basically has no predictive value. You might as well be flipping a coin and telling the patient what to do. So an area under the curve of 0.66 shows that what we're doing does have some predictive value. And then on the right is uh, GD importance. So these are the five features that our adult model considered important. Um, we can see that OMP was the most uh, significant variable, which makes sense because, uh, again, that's our proxy for stone size, and we assume that that would have a, a large predictive value. And we tried the, we tried running these models with just OMP and just OMP and age because we thought that like their importance seems much more much larger than the other ones. But those models actually performed significantly poorer. And we found the reason for that was that these other smaller variables like previous prior stone episodes, nausea, renal, renal pelvis dilation, were really important for deciding those edge cases where stone size wasn't, was kind of in the middle and wasn't very useful for making a prediction. So these features did improve our model significantly, which is why we decided to keep them in. Um, this is our pediatric model. We have um, slightly better accuracy and a better area under the curve of 0.75. Like I mentioned earlier, the features are a little bit different. Um, OMP, age, and renal pelvic dilation are still there, but instead we have stone location and fever here. We did the same thing where we tried to run just OMP and age or just OMP. And again, our model didn't perform as well. It was because of those edge cases where OMP is kind of in the middle and not very uh, useful for prediction. So what are the implications of this? So uh, we hope that this model could be used to improve shared decision-making between patients and their physicians when deciding treatment options for renal stones. Um, we hope that it's just another data point that uh, clinicians and their patients have when like deciding whether to go for surgery or not. Um, and then while especially large stones and small stones are easier to predict, our, our model can help make decisions for the cases where there isn't a clear answer based on stone size, like I talked about on the last slide. And that we also like, I think it's important to note that like features outside of stone size are important predictors in, de in determining whether patients need surgery. And what we're looking to do forward is um, we're continuing to add data to refine our models further. We have some data that we're currently abstracting. So hopefully that'll increase our model accuracy and improve them a little bit. We also plan to integrate this model with the work that Yu Ming was talking about earlier. Um, the goal is that a new model could create a more accurate and less laborious method to predict stone passages as opposed to manual measurements and interpretation of imaging alone. So those two models together could be really powerful because they could just immediately give you a value for what uh, the likelihood of the stone passing spontaneously is, which would be a very valuable uh, tool clinically. And that is it. There's my email and I want to thank all those people for their help. And that's our funding source. Thank you very much for that excellent explanation of a challenging topic. Um, and again, stick around because I'm sure there'll be questions and comments for you. So the next speaker is joining us virtually and it is Dr. John Dalbo. He's from the Duke University P20 Center. Do we have his, his presence? I am, I am here if I can share my screen. Okay, so um, maybe we haven't given him permission to share his screen. Can everyone see that? Hopefully now we can. Up now. There we go. Great, thank you so much. So hello everyone, it's my pleasure to be participating in this annual Caribou meeting and tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing here at Duke to model and simulate laser ablation. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. My name is John Dalbo. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and material science at Duke University. The images on this slide provide just a little bit of a teaser of some of the results I'll be discussing this morning. This work is in collaboration with Yuan Chen Liu, a PhD student in my group here at Duke, who performed all of the theoretical and simulation work. Other collaborators include doctoral student Jung Kin Chen, who you all met this morning. Uh, Jung Kin, we're thrilled that you're there representing us in, per in person. Uh, Jung Kin performed the experiments uh, that I'll briefly discuss. And finally, Professor Pei Zhang here at Duke. And of course, we're very grateful for the support from NIH to this project. 
So what I'll describe this morning concerns one part of our overall efforts to develop a fully coupled model and accompanying simulations for laser ablation. This is ongoing work here at Duke and is a collaboration with Kevin Wong and others at Virginia Tech. So the physics of laser lithotripsy is rather complex and we're not trying to capture everything in our models, but rather focusing on including those parts that we think are important for various quantities of interest. And that actually includes a fair amount. So here I'm showing you a movie of a part of a laboratory experiment where a stone phantom made of Vega stone is submerged in water and subjected to repeated pulses of a laser. The movie is on repeat and just focusing on one pulse in particular. So we're trying to build a model that captures quite a bit of this from the laser fluid interaction that would give rise to the bubble formation, for example, to the fluid stone interaction, that would be the collapse of the bubble and the loads it transmits to the surface, the laser stone interaction being the photothermal ablation and the damage or fracture of the stone that gives rise to eventual surface removal. I think there was a really important study that came out of Duke last year in the Journal of Endourology that indicated very large volumes could actually be ablated from stone surfaces, even when the laser fiber is not oriented perpendicularly like this, but parallel to the surface, right? And that's really not, I think, what is ter still terribly well understood because in that case, clearly photothermal ablation is not a factor at all. So a large part of what we're trying to do with our modeling efforts here is to better understand the relative importance of the photothermal effects compared to the loads that result from the fluid loads resulting from effects like the bubble collapse, cavitation, and et cetera, in the hopes of informing treatment protocols. Okay, so today I'm just going to focus on the photothermal component. And one way to do that is to remove the coupling with the surrounding fluid to the extent that we can. So we started this by conducting some laser ablation experiments of wet stone samples, but treated in air instead of underwater. So lots of caveats here in the sense that there's quite a bit missing from the picture when we do this, but this is about the only way to separate out the various components of the physics and make sure we understand them in isolation. The samples were subjected to relatively small pulses of 0.2 joules at 20 Hertz for up to 1000 pulses total. So we tested this for two standoff distances, essentially the distance between the fiber tip and the surface of the sample before any laser pulses are fired of zero and half a millimeter. Importantly and distinct from what you would expect in a clinical setting, the position of the fiber tip in the experiments is held fixed in space as pulses are fired. So as material gets ablated, the surface moves further away from the fiber tip. So in each experiment, after subjecting the surface to a certain number of pulses, it might be 50 or 100 or 200, et cetera, up to as many as 1,000. We image the surface of the sample, such as shown here on the bottom right. For comparison to the model-based simulation results in the crater profiles, we identify the point of maximum depth in the crater and then trace two different paths across it, anomaly in, say, an X direction and a Y direction, because those two profiles will differ. There's a random aspect to the actual experiments in terms of the composition of the Begastone samples that will be evident in part by differences between the traces along these two paths. Okay, so here's an example of how the crater volumes tend to develop with increasing number of pulses. For each standoff distance, there were 10 different samples tested, and so you can see the error bars here. And there is some noise in the data, but what you can clearly see, I hope, is that while there is a sharp increase in the crater volume within the first 100 pulses or so, that saturates and there's only a moderate increase in the volume beyond that. That saturation point varies with standoff distance, whether it's zero or a half a millimeter, but after about 400 pulses or so, there's not much of an appreciable increase to the crater volume in either case. So we developed a relatively simple model for thermal ablation here that I'll try to describe briefly. Imagine we have a domain that is interacting with an incoming laser beam. And what we're interested in is how the surface of the domain, gamma here, evolves with space and time. So we're going to assume that we know the profile of the beam 
in terms of its incoming energy, uh, both its amplitude spatially and as a function of time to match the frequency of 20 hertz, for example. Now we know that the width of the beam expands as we move away from the fiber tip. And this is vital to include in the model because as material is removed from the surface, the effective distance between the fiber tip and the sample increases in the experiment beyond any initial standoff distance because the laser fiber is held fixed in space. As more and more material is ablated, points on the ablated surface effectively experience a lower incident laser energy density at any given point underneath, uh, uh, underneath the, the tip, depending upon the effective proximity. So just a few details about the model itself, which is almost entirely energetic in nature. We'll look to capture the evolution of the temperature field, capital T here, in both space and time throughout the sample at every point. This is essentially transient heat conduction. In terms of how the surface evolves, the model is also energetic. In essence, what this equation indicates here is that the difference between the incoming laser energy and the thermal resistance of the material is what accounts for how fast the surface moves with a velocity V here in proportion to its density and latent heat. There are also some additional conditions which stipulate that the temperature on the surface can exceed the melting temperature of the material. So the model is simple in the sense that in addition to specifying the laser beam, it only requires the thermal properties of the material as shown here. And by and large, these are all easily measurable or can be estimated independently. To begin, we will consider the, the case when these properties are independent of temperature, just to further simplify things. In terms of the discretization of the model, that's actually non-standard. And we relied on a method that allows the surface geometry to evolve through the background finite element mesh. So unfortunately, this is not something you'll find readily available in commercial software, for example. It's a state-of-the-art method that relies on something called the extended finite element method or XFEM for short. And we're not the first to do this. In fact, we have some collaborators who have developed this for other types of ablation applications. So the movie here is just a toy simulation to show you what this looks like, indicating the temperature fields on the surface and the evolution of the geometry as a laser pulses the surface and moves. So in the actual simulations we'll do, we won't be moving the laser tangentially. This is just to, to indicate what it looks like. And it's only showing you the portion of the domain that remains and not the parts that have been ablated. Okay, so when we first applied this model using material properties and laser settings that are as close to the actual experiments as possible, what we found is that the simulations gave rise to ablated volumes that vastly exceeded what was observed in the experiments. Certainly one explanation for that is that the model's too simple, but remember it's mostly energetic. And so we started to interrogate the results of the experiments a bit more to understand how much of the incoming laser energy might actually be needed to ablate the volumes we were seeing. So what we did, to, what we did is to think about this in terms of an effective absorption ratio at the surface. So using the volume, of material that was ablated, VA here, after a number of pulses, for example, what we did is just roughly calculate the total amount of energy that would be required to raise the temperature of that volume uniformly, okay, from the initial uh, uh, temperature in the room, for example, from room temperature all the way to the melting temperature, that's the total delta T, and then added in what was needed for the latent heat. So to get a ratio, we compared that to the total amount of laser energy that had come out of the laser tip up to that same point in time. And then we plotted that as a function of pulse number, as you can see here for the two standoff distances. So again, this data, it's entirely from the experiments and they're not from this, this isn't from the simulations. And what these indicate here is that only a relatively small portion of the incoming laser energy, right, at max 2%, is needed to explain the volume that's been removed from a purely thermal standpoint, right? So one way to calibrate the model is to introduce a constant C1 that reduces the strength of the incoming beam at the surface. So that simple analysis of the energy I just showed and all the results I'm about to show here are in a paper that's currently under review with Yuan Chen Liu as the lead author. So here are some of the results we obtain with a calibrated model where we've matched the ablated crater geometry results reasonably well. 
So the blue and red traces here are from one of our experimental craters. The simulations are two-dimensional axisymmetric simulation results. So we're just showing you a slice here and the simulations always yield a symmetric profile. But nevertheless, what I hope you can see is that in terms of those two paths from the experimental crater that intersect the point of maximum depth, the simulations do pretty well. Two different simulation results here are just for two different levels of mesh refinement, and they indicate that at least with respect to the crater geometry, our simulation results are sufficiently spatially resolved. So now if we look at just the crater volumes and the areas for a standoff distance of zero, um, for what I'm showing here is a comparison of the experimental results with three different calibration constants C1, corresponding to different percentages of the incoming energy. And we see that a value of 1% does a fairly good job of matching the qualitative aspects of the evolution of the crater volume and area with pulse number. But we can also see that values of a half a percent and 2% effectively bound the experimental data. If we then use that same calibration and look at results, the 1% the calibration value, look at the results for both standoff distances, we once again see a fairly good comparison with the experimental data. And if we can go back to that calculation of the effective absorption as a function of pulse number and see that the trajectories of the experimented model line up fairly well. Here for the model-based simulation results, we're just using this, the simulated ablated volume in the calculations as opposed to what is observed in the experiments. And once again, I just like to emphasize the role that the effective distance between the laser fiber tip and the stone surface plays here. As the surface is ablated and points underneath the tip effectively move away, the laser energy density at those points decreases due to the spreading of the beam. I suspect most people at this meeting understand that proximity to the fiber tip matters. And so if we're going to build models that are useful, it helps to account for that. Okay, so to summarize, I just wanna emphasize that our efforts are focused on the development of a fully coupled model for laser ablation, because we know that there are many effects that contribute to ablation from photothermal effects to cavitation. In many cases, the conventional wisdom is that photothermal ablation is dominant, but some of the recent experiments of Duke have indicated that cavitation is a significant contributor. So our, as part of our efforts to build a fully coupled model, what I discussed today focused on just the photothermal ablation, where we looked at Begastone samples treated in air. Now I'm very much a subscriber to the old George Box quote that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so here, I think the utility of this relatively simple model for thermal ablation has been borne out by its ability to provide somewhat realistic crater geometries compared to experiments, but also to shed light on why we see this saturation if the laser is held fixed relative to the stone surface, and that the percentage of laser energy that is actually being used for ablation is relatively small. Uh, thank you all for your attention, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. And uh, if you'll stay um, on the line, there might be some questions or comments for you in the Q&A at the end of the session. That's the plan. Our next speaker will be Michael Lipkin with the Duke University P20 Center. Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to present. I'm sorry I am unable to be there in person. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Lipkin. I am the uh, Karen Robertson Associate Professor of Urology at the Duke University School of Medicine. I'll be presenting work on the behalf of my, myself and uh, my collaborators, particularly in mechanical engineering, Dr. Pei Zong and his lab. Uh, I'll be presenting on the thulium fiber laser lithotripsy. What are the optimal dusting settings? Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so just a brief overview of what I'd like to discuss. Uh, I'll start out with a very high level considerations for optimal dusting settings. And again, when we refer to dusting, I'm talking about uh, treating stones, particularly in the kidney with ureteroscopic laser lithotripsy. Um, I will share the optimal settings for homium, which is sort of the standard bearer, what we've been using for the past 20 to 25 years to treat stones. I'll then show some of the work in our lab that demonstrate what the optimal settings may be for the thulium fiber laser and how they may be different than the homium. And then finally, I'll discuss some of the work in our lab that demonstrates why the homium and thulium ideal settings may be different. So again, when I refer to dusting, I again talking about treating particularly intrarenal stones, ureteroscopically, 
by taking a laser and converting the stone into dust that should pass on its own. The goal of dusting is to effectively and efficiently turn the stone into dust. And I think efficiency is particularly important with dusting as we're treating larger and larger stones. Now, to be clear, there's no definitive definition of dust. Olivier Traxer and his group in uh, Europe have tried to define this and basically have what they've defined it as is any particles that float or stay in suspension. I think at minimum, we could all agree that we want fragments that are less than one millimeter in size as these should pass easily from the kidney without incident. Now, one of the other important considerations when we're talking about dusting is safety. And the big safety issue with ureteroscopic laser lithotripsy is heat generation, as a lot of the laser energy gets converted to heat in the irrigant and in the kidney. And we'll see how this impacts potentially the settings that we need to use. Now for the homium laser, a lot of our dusting settings are based off this foundational paper, which was published in 2012. Joel Teichman, who's the senior author here, did a lot of the foundational research on homium laser lithotripsy mechanics. And in this study in particular, the group looked at the effects of laser energy on fragment size using the homium laser. They used a number of different energy settings and they measured the fragments that were created. And what they found was that at 0.2 joules, the lowest energy setting available on a homing laser, 100% of the fragments created were less than one millimeter. As the energy increased, the percentage of those small less than one millimeter fragments decreased, meaning bigger fragments were created. And so this really formed the basis of how we went about setting our dusting settings and for the homium laser, the dogma is that you need low energy to create these small fragments in order to effectively dust. Well, to be efficient, then we needed to use higher frequencies. And so this is a video of uh, dusting with a homium laser at 0.3 joules and 120 hertz, which is 36 watts. And typically we use settings between 0.2 joules or 0.4 joules, sometimes up to 0.5 joules and 50 to 120 hertz. And this requires a high powered homium laser to efficiently do this type of surgery. And so with these settings though, we run into a concern with heat generation, particularly with the homium laser. We're talking about dusting at 20 to 50 Watts for typical settings. And at these high power, you can deliver a high amount of energy. And this energy is largely converted to heat again in the irrigant within the kidney. We also know that tissue injury has been reported to occur at about 43 degrees centigrade. So the question is, while we're dusting, are we potentially creating damage within the kidney? And this was a study done out of, uh, by the group in the University of Michigan, where they looked at temperature in an in vivo model, a pig model, in a calyx where they fired a laser at, uh, at, at settings of 0.5 joules and 80 hertz, which are uh, dusting settings or pop dusting settings and they measured the temperature at different irrigation rates. Uh, this red line here represents that 43 degrees C uh, mark where you could have tissue damage. And you can see here with sort of medium irrigation, which I would say is probably what's typical for our surgeries, at about 12 to 13 seconds, you surpass that 43 degrees centigrade, and it remains above that for the remainder of the firing of the laser. If you don't use any irrigation, which we do sometimes, particularly if we don't have good efflux from the kidney, the temperature rises above 43 degrees even quicker. And even at high irrigation, you could see that the temperature approaches and reaches that 43 degrees centigrade mark. And so with these high powered homing lasers, you can surpass a 43 degrees centigrade temperature fairly easy and irrigation mitigates it to an extent. Does this matter? Well, they harvested the kidneys and did pathological um, evaluations. And what they found were even macroscopic evidence of pathological damage from the heat within the kidneys. And so the question remains, what's the clinical implications of this? Uh, as of now, I don't think that's determined, but you can imagine a scenario where people have to go repeated ureteroscopic surgeries and perhaps we'll find out it'll impact their kidney function. Similarly, the repeated shockwave lithotripsy episodes have due to microvascular damage. Now the question is, what is this a concern for thulium? Again, we want to understand what are the ideal settings for thulium. 
Well, heat is also a concern for the thulium laser, and it may even be a greater concern. Um, when the Salty laser, which was the first thulium fiber laser uh, launched in the market by Olympus, was released, there were three mod adverse event reports submitted to the FDA. This is a system for aftermarket reporting, uh, after launch market reporting of um, adverse events. There were two strictures that were noted, which were felt to be likely heat related, and one intrarenal, one report was just intrarenal thermal damage. Um, these were using presets um, that the uh, company initially had on the laser, which were high powered, again, based off homium settings. Um, since then, the laser set presets have been modified and I'm not aware of any further reports. Um, and this is a, a study that Dwayne Baldwin's group out of Loma Linda looked at and compared temperature rises for the same power with thulium and homium. And here you can see that firing at 30 watts of the same power, the thulium laser actually generated more heat and approached that 43 degrees C mark um, where the homium laser at the same power did not. So I think thulium, with thulium laser, heat may even be a greater concern, all the more reason to understand what the optimal settings are. Optimal settings for thulium are further compounded by the fact that there's just a tremendous increase in the possible energy frequency combinations. For most homium lasers, the range of settings ranges from about 0.2 joules to 150 and up to 150 hertz. For thulium, you have down to 0.02 joules and up to 2,500 hertz. And again, the mechanism of lithotripsy may be different given that it has lower peak power compared to homium and a longer pulse duration. So really the optimal settings for thulium are not established. It's not clear if we just take what we did for homium and move it to thulium, i.e. low energy, high frequency, whether it's high energy, low frequency, and what the ideal pulse width would be. And again, this is demonstrated by a, a really a nice but simple study that uh, Dr. Traxler did looking at Twitter experts' recommendations for thulium. Uh, it ranged from anywhere from 0.05 joules to 0.5 joules, 30 hertz to 400 hertz, 7.5 watts to 45 watts. And here's just the distribution of settings. So we wanted on a benchtop uh, uh, um, model to find the ideal settings for thulium at safe total power, whether it be 10 or 20 watts. We used an automated step model, uh, step mover machine in a dusting model on hard and soft bagel stones using an IPG thulium fiber laser. We did sieve the effluent after lasering, but I will tell you that none of the settings that we create anything that would be considered a fragment, not even approaching a millimeter. Um, so that really wasn't a consideration that we were concerned about. Uh, we use different settings at hard and soft stones at different standoff distances due to the fact that with the homium laser, we, we found that actually at a standoff distance of 0.5 millimeters was ideal for dusting. And I'll show some of that data later when we talk about mechanisms. Uh, we fixed the speed of the fiber at one millimeter per second for 10 watts and two millimeters per second for 20 watts. And we made fixed trough lengths and measured the bladed volume using optical coherence tomography. These are the settings we used. Here you can see examples of the OCT craters. And what you'll notice is that as the energy increases, the energy for the same wattage, the trough volume increases. So 0.5 joules have the largest trough volume. And when we compare our different settings at different staffing off distances, whether we do 10 watts or 20 watts, one joule at the highest trough volume, irrespective of standoff distance. In fact, one joule and 10 hertz had a very similar ablation volume as one joule and 20 hertz. And so volume increase with increasing energy. What about the effects of pulse duration? Unlike homium, where pulse modulation and even long pulse is more efficient for dusting, in the thulium, we looked at um, whether shorter long pulse will be uh, better. Here again, the pulse durations are much longer than chromium. Short pulse is 1.73 milliseconds, long pulse is 3.46. And across the board at different standoff distances, short pulse was more efficient. So one joule and 10 hertz at short pulse appears to be the most efficient, and probably safest uh, setting for thulium. And it, there you can use less overall power, reducing the risk from heat. So why is this? So homium has a much shorter pulse duration and higher peak power than thulium. So the mechanism of ablation is likely different. What about the role of cavitation? Well, our lab has recently published that cavitation actually does play a vital role in stone dusting with the homium laser. And then 
This study, we looked at a dusting model using 0.2 joules and 20 hertz with a holmium laser on both bago stones and calcium oxide stones. And we performed the ablation in air and water at different standoff distances, so contact, 0.5, and one millimeter. And then we measured the ablation every 100 pulses. What we have found is that with a calcium oxalate stone, in water at 0.5 millimeters was the most efficient ablation and significantly greater ablation than in contact in air. With a bagel stone, this was even more pronounced. And again, you could see that with a slight standoff distance, in water really improved the ablation. Um, and this, in fact, the water, uh, the crater volume was greater in water than air by 80% and greater standoff distance at 0.5. And this supports that cavitation plays a significant role in dusting for the holmium laser. And what about the thulium? So we did a slightly different test where we used a, we tested dusting with and without a flexible ureoscope close to the laser tip. And the presence of the ureoscope can dampen bubbles, reducing cavitation. And what we found on the left is without the ureoscope and on the right was with the ureoscope, and we found that irrespective of the rear scope, the trough volumes were very similar. There was very minimal difference, suggesting that with a thulium laser, there's very minimal role of cavitation and it's primarily a photothermal effect. So the mechanism is different. And this is why it perhaps is that the settings need to be so different. So really in conclusion, what are the optimal dusting settings? So for homium, again, low energy, high frequency, probably with a standoff distance of 0.5 millimeters. For thulium, we want high energy, low frequency, shorter pulse duration in contact with the stone. And this is gonna have lower overall energy and a lower risk of heat injury. And this is likely due to the fact that the mechanism of dusting, dusting is different, meaning less role of cavitation with thulium. Now there are further studies still needed to further uh, deduce the full mechanism for thulium. And really the question is, what are the ideal conditions and settings for dusting? Which laser is better with which stone composition? Is there uh, certain stones that are more effectively treated with a homium laser versus a thulium? And again, what are the ideal stone, uh, are, do the settings vary based off stone composition? Again, thank you for the opportunity to present our lab's research and I appreciate the time uh, to present. All right, that was Dr. Michael Lipkin. He won't be with us for the Q&A uh, because that was recorded. But anyway, the last speaker in this section is Dr. Sonia Farr, and she is from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, the P20 Center there. And she'll be rounding out the session with a talk about endogenous oxalate synthesis. All right, so thank you very much for the chance to um, present our work, which is a collaboration to UAB and UT Southwestern. Um, so backtracking a little bit about kidney stones for those of you who do not know much about them, well, that may not be a lot, um, it's about one about in 11 people will develop a kidney stone in their lifetime, and 10% will have two more recurrences, and 50 of patients uh, for this will be within a nine-year period. And kidney stones are associated with the risk of kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease, as well as a number of other comorbidities, uh, bone fractures, cardiovascular disease. And we've seen a great increase in the prevalence of kidney stones in the last decades. So we know that recurring kidney stones cause significant morbidity and they're linked to a number of other conditions, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and CKD. So the most free, we all know that the most frequent um, composition for kidney stones is calcium oxalate and the number vary a bit and some uh, stones are a mixed composition. But we know calcium oxalate is um, the main com component. And we know that urine chemistry is influenced the risk of kidney stones. Um, there's been studies are showing that the incident stone risk increases in relationship to the concentrated of oxalate in the urine, even within um, the normal range, which is for oxalate 20 to 40 milligrams a day. So even when it's supposedly normal, the higher your urine oxalate, the greater the risk of kidney stones. 
And superstaration of calcium oxalate has also been shown to be um, linked with the risk of stone formation. Now, on the other hand, um, when it comes to causes, 15% of all types of kidney stones um, have been linked to a monogenic cause of kidney stones. And that includes calcium uh, phosphate, cysteine stones, a few of them calcium oxide stones. Um, so most of uh, the time it's, it's labeled idiopathic, which means not much. And that results in the fact that there's, for the majority of patients, treatment is symptomatic. Since we don't know the cause, we can't address the, the cause. So what about oxalate? Oxalate is a most acidic decarboxylic acid, and it readily complexes with cations. And the problem is that the calcium oxalate salt is poorly soluble. In humans, oxalate is an end product of metabolism, and it's most entirely cleared by the kidney. So where does oxalate come from? Well, you can divide it in two big groups. One is a diet, and the other one is endogenous production. Diet resources are um, known. So with them, you have dietary oxalate that's found in mostly plants, and it can be found in seeds and leaves and tubers. And you have dietary precursors of oxalate, such as collagen. On the other hand, you have endogenous synthesis, which involves a number of precursors that have been identified. Um, one of them is cobic acid, and the number of them are linked to the metabolism of glyoxalate, which is a direct precursor to oxalate. And uh, in a landmark paper that was published 20 years ago, and healthy volunteers were put on a control diet with different amounts of oxalate and calcium in the, in the diet. And 24 urine oxalate was measured in, in those um, volunteers. And that led us to the uh, conclusion that dietary diet contributed between 24 and 53% of urine oxalate. So it's quite a bit of variability. And the absorption, which was um, how much of the oxalate uh, um, could be uh, uh, subtracted from uh, the urine values, uh, varied between 6 and 55%. Um, and a more recent study that uh, we're completing at UAB, uh, led by Dr. Knight, uh, in um, healthy volunteers who uh, did two diets. One is a low oxalate normal calcium, another one is a high oxalate low calcium, to uh, increase the, the absorption of oxalate, does show that uh, moving on to the low to high oxalate, there's an increase in urinary oxalate, but it varies a lot. As you can see in the graph here, there's about a threefold difference between people in the amount of oxalate they absorb from the diet. And what factors could influence the, absor absor uh, the absorption? One is the, tr the different factors, um, mechanisms that involve in the absorption. So we're thinking that paracellular fluxes and transit absorption play a role. The family of transporter LCC26 has been uh, um, shown to, to be involved. Um, the role of calcium, magnesium, bile acids in the, in, the, in the gut, and of course, microbiome will play a role. And on the other hand, you may have secretion of uh, oxalate in, in, uh, in the gut. And now going to the other part, which is endogenous synthesis, as I said, um, some sources have been identified over the years, mostly using uh, uh, isotope traces, stable isotopes, um, although in the 60s it was carbon-13 isotopes. So ascorbic acid is a major source of oxalate, uh, apparently. Um, this is a study you also um, conducting at UAB to confirm that, maybe about 40% of urine oxalate. On the other hand, you have, uh, and this is an enzymatic pathway, on the other hand, you have enzymatic pathways that involve glyoxalate. And um, I'm just showing here three major precursors, major in the terms that we know what they are, hydroxyproline, glycolate, and glycine. Um, overall, they contribute about 30% if our calculations are correct. Um, so they still seem like maybe there is something missing. And another number that you haven't really seen here is how much in total does it, does it mean? So a study that we're, um, we've just finished at UAB uh, was trying to measure the endogenous synthesis in healthy volunteers uh, who are put on a five-day control diet, low oxalate diet, and they receive an infusion of carbon-13 oxalate. And um, this study, um, we found that on average it was 17 milligrams a day, but it varied here again in a two-fold range. But the good news is that endogenous synthesis seemed to correlate pretty well with 24-year in oxalate on the low oxalate diet, as you can see here with the correlation. Not perfect, but good enough. What about stone formers? Well, as less is known about stone formers, um, urinox fluctuation is known to be higher, but when the studies were done without dietary control. So as I hope I've convinced you, it's hard to um, draw a conclusion from that. So there's outstanding questions, multiple. And uh, one of them is, is our synthesis increase in stone formers? 
does BMI influence renal expression in stone formers? And what factors impact uh, good absorption of oxalate? What I'm gonna to show today, the study that we um, did was trying to address the top two questions. So the study design with this, we had two sites, um, UAB and UT Southwestern. Uh, we recruited adult um, subjects um, with calcium oxalate kidney stones um, of a low BMI, normal BMI and uh, obese um, BMI group. We uh, excluded uh, a known cause of apoxaluria. 22 people were screened, um, 19 completed, one is still in the study. So I'm putting the data for 19. And um, to compare it to, we have another study um, that was done in healthy volunteers at UAB, um, which is the study that I talked about in the endogenous synthesis group, um, recruiting adults with the BMI between 18 and 45, and also had 20 people who completed the study. Study so design was very similar, which is why I'm showing you the, the, the results side by side. Um, both uh, all participants underwent screening, collected 225 units screening on their soft choice diets, um, went onto a low site normal calcium diet uh, for two days, and then collected on the same low site diet 225 urines. The addition and the uh, healthy volunteer group, they received an infusion of oxalate the uh, following day to uh, help us measure the uh, synthesis rate. And then um, most people had a DEXA scan at the end to uh, look at anthropometrics. So in the two groups, the demographics are very similar, um, not simply different. So I'm gonna go quickly over that. Uh, they were especially not different in terms of lean mass and BMI, although um, body composition was a bit different. But, and also and then we found people with diabetes, uh, hypertension, metabolic syndrome in the two groups. So in stone formers, um, receiving the oxalate diet did result in a decrease in urine oxalate. As you can see here, there was about a 26, uh, sorry, 15 milligram decrease in, oxalate, in urine oxalate from the self choice to the low oxalate diet. And that was true in both female and male uh, participants. And you can see most people did decrease, so the few that did not, but some of them, it was a dramatic decrease. Now in stone formers, urine excretion to 24 oxalate excretion on the low oxalate diet was associated with BMI, also with lean mass, but not fat mass, and was associated with urine creatinine, 24 urine creatinine. And the non-stone formers, there was no association with BMI or fat mass, but there was association with lean mass and with urine creatinine. And um, when we compared the stone formers versus non-stone formers on the same diet, uh, stone formers had a greater 24 urine excretion compared to non-stone formers, um, which you can uh, show here, it's about six milligrams uh, difference on the same diet. And that was true even when we adjusted for lean mass and urine creatinine in the two groups. So our conclusion from the, these studies are uh, here a few. So differences in dietary oxalate intake cannot entirely explain the greater urinary exposure in, in stone formers. And stone formers, calcium oxalate stone formers, may have increased oxalate synthesis compared with non-stone formers. And apparently, this does, it does show that urinary exposure is influenced by BMI, but that's possibly via the muscle mass components. People with greater BMI also have a greater lean mass. And that would be, uh, could be explained by the fact that muscle is rich in collagen, which is a source of hydroxyproline, which is a source of oxalate, unknown, and also AA. So this could be a, um, the pathophysiology of, uh, the, um, of that source of oxalate in stone form, and that why does that happen? This is why we, need, we propose to do future work to try to actually confirm the results in stone formers um, by using carbon sensing isotopes to measure endogenous synthesis and try to um, determine which sources are increased in stone formers. Um, also, now we might want to look at the absorption of oxalate in the stone formers, and we can use that using fixed diets with different oxalate composition, use of uh, um, tracer oxalate, and using triple sugar test to look at mechanism mechanism of um, the different gut segments, and also look at the gut microbiome in those. Um, uh, patients to assess the impact uh, on the on stone forming and that's all i have and that i will thank everybody who was uh, leading the study at u southwestern is dr maluf dr asimus at uab and our funding so um the work in the kidney stones were done with a p20 uh, um, and the stone formers was uh, funded by my r3 and i'll take any questions